Welcome. What's good, everybody? Thank you all for tuning in. You're rocking with the boys over at Man to Man, where we bring a unique vibe to the traditional sports talk show. This is your co-host, Andy Elliott. Alongside your co-host, Liam, the hoop star, Nash. Namaste, Mr. Hoopstar. Listen, we're on Dash Radio's Nothing But Net channel. You can also find us on all streaming and social platforms at Man to Man Podcast. Leave us a five star review, subscribe to our channel, but most importantly, share with your moms and get your damn mercy. Interested in creating a podcast but don't know where to start? We've been asked this question more times than LeBron has corrected his hairline. <laughs> our answer make a great first impression and start with your cover art. Look good, feel good, podcast better. Fiverr is an online marketplace for freelance services and low-cost providers from all over the world, and it gets its name from the starting price of services, which is only $5. Let the boys over at Man to Man give you a head start and hit the link in our description to get started. Super cool. We've used Fiverr for our cover art. It's like the first thing we did, and uh, we love it, and we're probably going to go back to them and, and change it up a little bit here, but... We have a super cool interview for you guys today. Uh, if you enjoy good music, stick around. But before we dive into that, I feel like we have uh, sort of this obligation to shout out the Wizards and our guy Garrison Matthews for making a big time play late in the game. Uh, and, and we opened up the Wizards in our last episode struggling. And then the next night, you know, this whole game happened with the Nets and Garrison makes a huge steal over KD and you know, Wizards are down five. And anyways, they end up winning the game. So I feel like, Liam, we just kind of got to shout out the Wizards. Of course, it would happen like the next 24 hours after we drop our episode. Yeah, I mean, the Wizards still got some work to do. They, they've they lost a couple now since that game, but that was a good game to see. We got to shout out Garrison Matthews definitely for that big steal. I think he walked maybe uh, after a couple review. steps, four or couple five. steps, uh, but definitely uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, just – Feet tight on that baseline, get it to to Westbrook, and he knocks down a big, big shot mm -hmm. too. Um, but Matthews' hottest start in Wizards history from behind the three point line. His thirty six three pointers made are the most in franchise history through twenty eight games. So that's huge for him. Um, yeah. He's putting his his name in in the the GMs and the coaches' eyes for sure on that. Mm -hmm. um, we also saw a lot of crazy stuff happen last week. Court signed Karen. We talked about a little bit in our <laughs> weekly Wednesday. LeBron uh, kind of got into a beef with this girl. She got kicked out. Uh, yeah. Big old deal there. But Lamelo Ball is scoring a new career high in his third start. He's starting now. Um, mm -hmm. Zion Williamson's fastest to you know reach a thousand points uh, in forty four games. Last to do it, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, the big Joker himself. Uh, but yeah. I want to start this episode off with. This all-star game, it is official. There will be an all-star game in Atlanta on March 7th. Write it down in the books, maybe, right? Uh, <laughs> maybe. Voting <laughs> voting opened on January 28th um, and runs through February 16th. So go out on your team's website, get your vote in for who you want to be seen in this all-star game. Um, Kevin Durant, obviously, Got the most votes for the East. Uh, Kyrie uh, and James Harden, his teammates also as well, got some votes uh, following him. And then we see Bradley Beal kind of sneak in there as well. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, out West, LeBron James, top of the leaderboard. Um, Steph Curry also at the at the top spot for the guards. Um, you know, last year we didn't see him, uh, but we will this year, right? I think, yeah, well, there's a couple of other different names, and they're like Clay Thompson, of course, Bradley Beal. I think a lot of people are maybe feeling sorry for Bradley Beal. He got snubbed last year, I think. So, um, although, like, this is all good and well, and vo voting results are coming back after the first week, I think the bigger story is just these guys are not exactly interested in playing an all-star game this year. LeBron told reporters after uh, a couple games back that he has zero energy and zero excitement. Uh, about an all-star game this year. He says he doesn't even understand understand why we're having an all-star game, and it's more or less a slap in the face. And then we see Sacramento Kings guard De'Aaron Fox uh, told reporters that he's if he's being brutally honest, um, it's just stupid to have an all-star game. And um, I'm now questioning, too, if this is, is this is a good idea with the season being so compact this year and games are being scheduled at an unusually quicker pace than any other season uh, along with multiple games being postponed yeah i mean i think you said it 
I mean, obviously, this has to do with the the financial background backing of what this All Star and how much money it brings in every year. And De'Aaron, De'Aaron Fox pointed it out that you know, for an All Star player that is not to participate in this game while you know maybe uninjured, there's going to be huge fines. So the the NBA is going to get their money one way or another, right? Mm-hmm. So there is a possibility that the NBA and the Players Association will provide kind of this opt-out clause maybe for this All-Star game. But with that being said, you know, having the biggest names in, in you know, the sport, like a LeBron James to opt out, there's not really a purpose, right? It would be just be mm-hmm. another, you know, expi- exhibition match in the first place, right? So it's not like right. this, this could happen or it, it might happen. But like you said as well, the pandemic – kind of changed the way we live in in the world of professional sports we see that from top to bottom in all sports so i mean this this league has been surrounded you know all year with teams postponing games due to health and safety protocols we got to see kd get pulled uh out of the game twice Mm -hmm. uh in the same game due to this contract (laughs) tracing uh he goes out comes back in goes out i don't know it's it's a mess but right. for me, I think this is kind of a not a good idea because let the players rest. We we see you know uh, Kawhi Leonard, Giannis saying they want to go be with their families, and then two, mm-hmm. it just takes one positive case um, for all these players, possibly you know these other people, uh, to ruin it, and they'll have to be out even more. So if this does happen, then the league will have you know even more postponed games. So I say if the big names don't want to be in it, and kind of are raising doubt. Let's just not have it because I don't know. You you've been to All Star game. I, I don't know. You you tell me yeah. what your thoughts are. Yeah, obviously it'd be super cool to have an All Star game, but this sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. You got players from all over the country that will be congregated here in the same arena, and like you were saying, it it does just take one positive case to cause more postponements. And uh, for the first time in over a month, the NBA had just reported that there has been no positive COVID-19 cases. So, and so, yeah, I mean, I had the opportunity to attend the all-star game last year in Chicago and I get it, man. It's, it's super cool. It's, it's great to see, you know, the best, best athletes in the world do sit out, perform these ridiculous dunks, seeing every major celebrity sitting courtside and with the new rule, the Elam ending, uh, you know, the first time to X amount of points wins the game. It was one of the coolest things that I got to experience but, you know, with arenas during game day, only allowing limited seating, what's the point of conducting an all-star game if fans can't even go? Um, that being said, stopping the all-star game would be a difficult decision for the NBA. But after all, this is this one of the season's highlights, along with, you know, the opening games, the Christmas games, the playoff games, and the finals. However, signs point to, to this being the right decision during these, you know, unprecedented times and and we'll see uh what they decide to do here in the upcoming weeks yeah i mean we'll we'll see if they have an all-star game but uh with that we'll 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 move into the interview once again you're tuning in to man to man on dash radio we got a young stud in the wall joining the boys today on the rise if you don't yet know nashville native our guy levi humming you're about to meet one of the coolest most genuine country artist in the game right now. Levi, what's up, dude? Thanks for coming on and chatting with us, man. What's up? And for you guys that don't know, Andy was friends with my brother back in high school. And so I know Andy pretty right. well. I saw a lot of debauchery back in the day. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's it's been a minute since you came down into the old humming basement and yelled at Kenny I for, for being complete idiots, right? <laughs> I think I, part, I partook a couple times too, so. Right. Hey, brother like brother. Uh, Levi, we're glad to have you on. Like he was saying, you know, Liam and it's a small world in Nashville here. We all kind of know each other. Liam and Levi went to the same high school as well. Uh, I'm friends with Kaney, Levi's younger brother. Their family is amazing, has taken me under their wing what, probably way too many, <laughs> too many times before. Uh, and they're extremely talented, to say the least. But before we get into anything else, Levi... You just released another banger for the books. Your new single that came out this past Friday called A Home. Yeah. I mean, dude, you're talking about drinking wine at 9 p.m., knocking down walls, you know, doing some rent. Are you are you officially in love, dude? What What's going on over there, Levi? What's going on? I would say I'm 100% in love. And I also use 2020 because I've been off the road for about a year now. 
Um, I use it to actually renovate my house. And um, the song is just a true, like literally statement about renovating the house and watching my girlfriend and me turn that house into a home. Um, it's the first song I've ever released that I wrote hundred percent by myself. Um, so it's super honest and um, I'm excited about it. My fans seem to love it. Uh, we just got a lot of love from Spotify and Apple music and Amazon and all those people yesterday. So just yeah. grateful. I'm about to ride the train. Yeah. I'll tell you what, you're still over that, that at that home over on, um, is it Park Avenue right over here? I mean, I'm over off eighth, right? Yeah. Over, yeah. Same house. I remember you and Katie used to live in there and I wonder what it looks like now. It's probably all jacked up and cool looking, but um, <laughs> that's funny. It's what not is the same as it used to for sure. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, man, you're making us want to fall in love someday, man. Come on now. But what is, what was the, the true inspiration, I guess, behind, I know you briefly mentioned that, you know, in quarantine, you kind of, I guess you had a lot of time, but what is, is this song mean anything different to you than all these other little singles that you had out previously? Um, it's definitely the most like personal song I've ever released. Um, I would say that the difference in why this song is so personal is my girlfriend was like, she walked in the house and she was like, I want to live here with you. I want to be here with you, but you got to change a few things. <laughs> so I was like, all right, shit. All right, I guess we're going to go paint a few walls. And a few walls turned into like doing the floors, doing all this stuff. But it was crazy because like what the song says is like, we just started dreaming about the house and like what it was going to be one day. Um, and so I think there's a difference between a house and a home. And like I said before, it's like that to me was like the inspiration behind the song. And I literally wrote it watching her on a ladder painting the walls and I just thought about the whole thing. Like just in an instant, it's crazy. Like songs will either take three hours to write or sometimes it takes three minutes and that's what that one was like. How, how long did that one take you to write? Instantly. It was like, uh, I had the verse chorus just done. With like I, it, Some people think you write songs from like in here to out here. It's really comes down through the head and then out the mouth. That's how I, how I process music and um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a crazy thing when a song hits you like that, man, we're loving it. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. I mean, so your last official sing, uh, single was during quarantine, right? Yeah. Uh, you wrote good taste good and taste. yeah, I mean, obviously you've had other, you know, really big hit singles. I mean, we're talking millions of listens. And so I think at least for me, after listening to all these singles that you put out, I think all we're, we're kind of ready for this album. Are we, yeah. are we getting a, a debut album, a first first album this year or what's what's kind of your plans with that well i i kind of already kind of announced it so i'll just say it anyways but i um i'm putting out new music this spring um kind of the point of all this is going to be taking all these this music i've already released and compiling it with new music that's coming out and putting in one big project um i can't really talk too much more about it in terms of oh release. okay okay <laughs> so, no, there's, there's a lot of music coming um, I definitely used 2020 to write songs and to create, um, it's, it was definitely like, I wasn't sure if I would be inspired and I was definitely inspired through 2020. So got a lot of music coming and I'm really excited about it. And it's kind of a home is just step one of that whole process of new stuff. Awesome. I mean, I know we're rocking with it. Me and Andy were playing it all last night. We, we <laughs> love it. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's getting success. You kind of mentioned that, um, uh, but Success doesn't really happen overnight. So let's kind of take a step back here. And he kind of briefly mentioned it, but your dad, uh, you know, Marcus Humming, Grammy Award winning songwriter, composing songs for, you know, like Rascal Flats, Tim McGraw, those type of people, as you can see. Um, but kind of growing up, was there any pressure on you to kind of follow in your father's footsteps? Or maybe was there something else that you kind of wanted to do instead of music? Yeah, um, kind of how like my dad raised me and my brothers was that he wanted us to play an instrument, he wanted us to play a sport, and he wanted us to do well in school. Um, so there was like always like, hey, you should play an instrument, and there happened to be just guitars and everything around the house. Um, at first, music to me was just a hobby, and it was awesome. You know, like I didn't really understand what my dad was doing. I knew he was writing songs, but I never like I kind of took for granted the fact that the Dixie Chicks and Rascal Flats and one day Jessica Simpson, all these people are at the house. <laughs> and uh, I would just be like, it was just like part of like life. And then right. as I started to kind of go into music myself in a more professional manner, um, now I look back and I'm like, wow, that really did inspire me. That did help me want to do this. And that did give me a different insight that other people probably don't have. Um, but yeah, like being surrounded by it definitely influenced me, but it never put a pressure on me. 
Hey, well, Levi, we see the paintings right there behind you, and I've seen the yeah. paintings in our house. You got you got some game in the crafts and arts world, man. But this is kind of funny, uh, you know, knowing Kaney does art and he's pursuing art as a profession right now. Did you guys both have a moment where it's like, all right, dude, you you can stick with the art. I'll go ahead and do the music. You know, brother, brother, compete, and then you guys realize, okay, maybe we should, you know, branch off to other things or no. Well, Kaney's definitely the better painter out of the two of us, so I don't have any competition. That means that I'm also a way better musician than he is. So, yeah. <laughs> well, uh... yeah, I, I am, but I am kidding. Um, but no, there was like there's brotherly competition, but music just like I just loved it more. Like I liked lyrics, I liked melodies, and I just can sing. So to me, it just kind of all made sense. But the craft of songwriting is my painting now. But I used to paint a lot, yeah. All right. Well, can't we know Kenny don't got the vocals like you, so we'll just leave it at that, right? <laughs> got the pipes. <laughs> got the pipes, baby. <clears throat> uh, but what? So was there this defining moment, kind of in your life, that you said I got to pursue music as my career, or kind of walk us through that? What is that a defining moment for you, or was there a defining yeah, moment for you? There was a defining moment, and um, I was a sophomore in college down at Eckerd College in St. Pete, Florida. And I had a guitar in the closet that I would pick up and you really just used to impress ladies and sing a couple songs here and there. I didn't really have like any real songs. Uh, but one day uh, the girl I was like just crazy about broke up with me. And in like the heartfelt Taylor Swift manner, I just picked up the guitar and just started mm-hmm. writing songs. And it would be like two songs a day, every day in my dorm. And I would stop going to parties. I stopped doing everything that was like the normal Levi shit. And I became the songwriter that sits in his dorm just as creative. Um, and what I would do is I would basically take those songs and send them back to my dad in Nashville. And I said, like, what can I do with this? Like, is this a thing? Um, and then he would send his, like, advice back. And basically it came to, hey, if you really want to pursue this, just move back home. Mm-hmm. And that next day, I remember I was like, transfer papers, Belmont University, because I couldn't drop out of college. And <laughs> transfer papers, I was like, I'm going to Belmont. I'm going to pursue this professionally. Um, and then eventually dropped out of Belmont. That was the rest. The rest was history. Levi, what year was that? Um, your sophomore year in college? I was 2010 graduating high school. So 2012, 2013. Okay. So I, was, years ago. I was about to say, did he make the love you hate you miss you in the dorms? Cause that was one of the first ones that I was rocking with dude. And I know that had to be about somebody, my guy. That was, uh, three years later, but okay. that's another girl. Oh, God. He's a lover boy out there, dang. All right. So, Levi, <laughs> you moved to, you know, you moved back to Nashville. And then, like, 2016 was your first EP. You got these singles. And, and like Liam was saying, all these singles are popping off. You're getting a lot of notice and whatnot. And then uh, we see you get the chance to open up and go on tour for Hunter Hayes. Um, I, I don't know, dude. We've seen the pictures, man. Anybody ever confuse you guys just going out there? You going out there first before <laughs> Yeah, that was a, I was like the Hunter Hayes with more tattoos. <laughs> um, Take us, go ahead, go ahead. But no, it, going out with him was sick. It was definitely like, because even our music is like a little bit similar in terms of like that really pop leaning country music, but it's like very melodic. Um, mm-hmm. And like his song Wanted, whether like you, whatever you think about freaking Hunter Hayes, like that song just still slaps. It's like one of the best songs like in country music. Um, I just so enjoy his fan base. His fan base like, totally latched onto my music. And to this day, like I played a show at the listening room last week and we had people from the tour from like Ohio, from Maine, from Knoxville, from Atlanta, from everywhere, come to Nashville to like be a part wow. of the show. And that was all from that tour. Uh, but I also got to open up for like Lady A, Tim McGraw, Keith Urban, all these amazing artists that year. Um, and so 2019 was just like freaking stellar. And I, learned so much and got to just experience these amazing artists and just be in front of their fans, which, you know, you just can't take for granted. Right. 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 Um, but would you say that that Hunter Hayes was kind of that first mentor for you at least, um, kind of in the big music country world? Yeah. So my first ever tour was actually with, uh, Michael Ray. Right. And I'd say Michael Ray actually was kind of my first like mentor as an artist. He, taught me how to do like a meet and greet line. He taught me how to like really interact with the crowd. And if you've not seen the Michael Ray show, um, he's like one of, he's just a straight up entertainer. That dude is like, whether it's a 500 seat club or he's opening for Brantley Gilbert and it's like 30,000 people that dude puts on a show every time. And I learned from him. I was like, that's how you do it. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter how big the crowd is. It just matters like how into it you are. 
And as my dad actually says, everybody gets the same show. So mm-hmm. put it on every time. Um, but Hunter Hayes, definitely. I mean, like that dude, uh, talent wise, there's nobody kind of in his level. He just plays everything. He knows how to play everything. Um, and so, yeah, these guys are just, every single artist is a mentor. Cool. All right. All right. <clears throat> Go ahead. Dude. Um, yeah. So, so take me through, you kind of mentioned a little bit, but let's talk about, you know, these big crowds this was kind of was this your kind of first big crowd uh with hunter hayes and then maybe did you have some butterflies maybe a little nerves going into that um i don't know what take us about like playing through these these different types of crowds and your interactions with your your these fan bases that you had so here's like how it works in country music for me like at my level because like I have all these millions of streams and I have certain markets where I do really well and other markets where nobody knows who I am just because that's how it is. Right. Um, I would open up for Tim McGraw for like 25,000 people and the next day go play an empty bar. I mean, that's just like how it would be for me like two years ago. And um, it's just like, it's like crowds have always been like up and down. Like for instance, the first show I ever played like as a professional artist with a deal was at the Ryman Auditorium opening up for Alabama. Right. <laughs> And like, so, oh, crazy, it's always like, it's always up and down. Uh, definitely not the first time I played for a big crowd, but um, his fan base, that was the first real tour I've been on. We had 21 shows, the entire country, New York to LA um, mm. and everything in between. And so there was always nerves. I mean, every day it's like you, you're tired one, you like have to get your mind ready, you have to get your show ready. Right. And um, it's always an experience. I mean, it's just freaking it's part of the grind. So right. Levi, you, you tour with, you know, Hunter Hayes, you open up for the legendary two point second set, set, seven seconds on a bull main blue main shoe. Uh, and then one of the other most historical places that you played as the, the grand old Opry, right? I mean, yep. you're talking about playing in different crowds, but I've, I've heard you on these YouTube videos talk about how that venue just has so much magic to it. Do you, that being said, do you have a venue that, that sticks out to you or a favorite performance that, that you can recall? Man, my debut at the Opry, we played, I think, 21 shows now at the Opry. Um, but just the Opry in general, it's so cool just to, like, be in Nashville and just drive out to, like, uh, Opry Mills, you know, the mall. Yeah. And just be out there. And then, like, sitting there that, like, we didn't realize as kids, I feel like, was this huge historic venue. Yeah. And, um, you know, as you fall more and more in love with country music, that place becomes more and more, like, a historical artifact. And mm-hmm. being able to be a part of that history is just so important um so yeah that was freaking that's the most memorable show for me um also my favorite venue and my favorite city to tour in is chicago and um, i already know it joe's yeah so joe's on we street like Uh. every time i go there (laughs) we finally sold it out as a headliner um which was really cool and it's just a really special venue and chicago is like one of those cities you don't expect to be a crazy country market Mm -hmm. but it is the most fun place to play a show yeah, I, I lived in Chicago last year for about 10 months. And, you know, we're good friends with Mitchell. We just had him on. He was like, Joe's, dude. Joe's yeah. hands down is like one of the coolest places to play. And I was like, man, I, I didn't get the chance to go to Joe's. But yeah, I mean, we've heard everybody talk about it. It's crazy, man. That's you'll, awesome. have, you'll have to come up with this one show just to see how wild it gets. It's like yeah, a yeah. different level. And there's another place up in Grand Rapids. That's, that's I think it's called the Intersection. And it's just another place. It's just like that. It's insane. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about your – I want to touch on it briefly, but – what about like have you toured over uh, like overseas as well, right? Yeah, uh, United Kingdom, right? Uh, take us through that just for a little bit. How that experience is a little different than touring maybe in the U.S. Yeah, um, whew. we played <laughs> the C2C, which is like country to country. Okay. Um, we did London a bunch, and then I actually went on tour with uh, Christian Bush, who's the lead singer of Sugarland. Sugarland, he's not a lead singer, he's the other guy, the man. And we went from like Scotland all the way down to London, just like north to south. Did the whole tour there, but I also got to do a thing called CMA Songwriting Series, and we played uh, Amsterdam, Stockholm, Munich, Berlin, uh, Oslo, and then basically went home. But that shit was crazy, and it is a totally different experience. Like America, it, they, I think – they just are so we have so much music and so many concerts that you just kind of like you go there you drink it's a party mm-hmm. and like when you go to like the uk and london and those places they really just like appreciate you making the effort to go across the pond and they're there to listen and to like hang out with you and they just want to be part of the experience and i think they consider us more like 
singer songwriters whereas in like the america it's just like country music pop music whatever in right. uk it's like if you can sit up there with your guitar and play your song you're a singer songwriter um so that's a different experience for sure with with those guys out there that listen to your music i mean how how big of a satisfaction of a feeling is is that i'd, I'd almost feel like that's almost something surreal rather than just playing in, in america and and going out there and be like oh wow this guy like really knows like all the all the lyrics to my songs yeah i think, I think like the one that got me was we were walking up to the the venue i think it's called bush gardens and it's in this middle of, of london and there was like six or seven people out there trying to take photos of me and get my autograph. <laughs> and I was like, like, how do you know who I am? I'm like, what's going on right now? And so we did that. And then we played the show that night. And literally everybody knew every word to every song. Wow. And then we came back a couple of years later. And then they knew there was like five times as many people. And they knew every single word to every song. And it was like this exponential growth that like I've never seen before in, in the U.S. Man, right. got the whole squad wild. rocking. <laughs> Here's another crazy story is that we were in Stockholm and at this like really nice hotel and the Rolling Stones were staying at the same hotel that night. Oh, and they nice, had like, nice. this huge, massive line of people in the middle of Sweden, like ready to see Mick Jagger and all these people. And we got out of our like bus and I swear to God, there was like three or four people looking for us to sign like autographs as well <laughs> in the middle of Stockholm, Sweden. And I was like, what? I was like, I don't even understand what's happening. And I'm like, I, I know I'm like, first of all, like in terms of star level, it's like way down here. But they like, I was like, the fact that one person knows who I am here just makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, dude. Right, right. Um, kind of like we said to open, success really doesn't happen overnight. It's kind of a grind. We've learned that as, you know, trying to grow our podcast. But you get to launch your own tour uh, in 2019 uh, called Drop of Us. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, you also had a single out that same year, State I'm In which is by far my favorite song. I think the just the lyrical genius behind that is I it's I, I've never heard anything like that before. Um, I really I really do. I really love that love that one. But kind of what what's the biggest difference between headlining your own tour and then compared to being on, you know, and, and opening to somebody else's tour? Um, well, we were supposed to do the second half of that tour in 2020. So that kind of like the whole point was 2019, we're going to hit it, give six month break and then hit it really hard again in 2020. And obviously that didn't happen. So it was like half of the tour happened, even though we played I think, 20 dates or whatever. Right. Um, I would say the difference between opening up for somebody and being the headliner is just the amount of work you put in. Like I had a freaking promote every night. I went to different sororities to go like, try to get girls to come <laughs> I, every city that like, regardless, I was like, every city I'm going to sorority. I'm going to go to the local radio station. I'm going to go do this. And so by the time the show happened, I had done three shows. I did a meet and greet show. Mm -hmm. I did a meet and greet line before the show. I played the show and then play the sh did a meet and thing after the show. And I probably went to bed at 2 a.m. every night, got back on the road at 7 a.m. and then hit it again. All right. So, so how, how many coffees? coffees? Bro, <laughs> so many copies. And then, so like that amount of work just was like, I was like, I really do take for granted when you get to open up for somebody, it's like a lot of times they have like, like big labels and stuff like that. And they have their like set fan base. So it's not as much, but man, to build it like a headlining thing, that's like mm. years and years of doing that. And so this was like kind of the first one. And we would have shows like at Joe's where we would sell it out and like Grand Rapids sell it out. But then we would mm. go to, Atlanta and have like 10 people there and like you put in the same amount of work but you just you know your fan base isn't there yet right and so you just got to build it like organically and you know it's not like TikTok you can't just have a thing go viral and like have a fan base like you got to freaking put in the work to have people buy tickets regardless right. of anything like it's like that is one place that is going to be grassroots until the day we die are you are you so are you saying that you would rather do your own tour or open up for these bigger stars? <laughs> what pick one if you had to? Uh, I would love to open up for the bigger stars always, but um, I think it's important just as an artist not to just rely on that. I think you got to build it up a little bit organic. And how I've done everything like in my career so far um, has been like off kilter and not like the way people usually do it. And right. like, I don't have a major label. I don't have, it's basically me and my management team putting out music. Mm -hmm. Um, and just like, and I have an amazing agent too, that puts me on these shows with Tim McGraw, et cetera. Um, but yeah, how you do it freaking 
how we want to do it is we want to do it different. And we also want to do it from the ground up and just build a foundation. So it's undeniable if something does break like crazy and right. we have, we already have that. I can sell 500 tickets here, 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 and here, and just right. be, rely on myself. Exactly. That's what how you kinda, do it. Tell us about the resiliency that you've had sort of, I mean, we like, you know, being in Nashville, you kind of hear all these guys talk about, man, like we can't go on tour. We can't do any of these songs. Just kind of tell us about the resiliency that you guys had in some of the obstacles that you guys ever faced. You know, obviously there's got to be a paycheck coming somewhere, but with COVID and everything, you can't do anything. So what did you guys do? Did you guys do Instagram live shows? Like, how did you get super creative with, you know, your craft and, and not in front of a lot of people physically, I guess? Well, man, I... Like I said, I played that show at the listening room earlier this week, and mm -hmm. it was just weird to play in front of a lot of people. I was like, it took me like one song to like kind of get my my wits about me. Mm -hmm. um, it is definitely like for me, it's it's the hardest I think because I love playing in front of a lot of people. Like that's why I do music. I don't want to be a social media star. That to me doesn't like doesn't like get my get me hyped up or anything. I just want to. I want to be in front of people. I love like the interaction. I like playing songs and hearing people sing my songs back to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I found more inspiration in just like the daily life of like having a girlfriend and having a puppy and mm -hmm. like just being inspired by that kind of stuff um, and just trying to just like slow down for a minute. And so and just taking that, you know, not taking that for granted and being like thankful for that time. Right. Um, but I think staying inspired is like the biggest thing. It's just like, as long as I'm writing music, I'm in a good space and it does suck not to tour though, for sure. Right. Right. Man, we got, we got Levi Hellman talking, talking some roots for us right now. Uh, we're, we're man to man on dash radio. Levi Hellman is with us in the house. Uh, before we let you go, Levi, we are going to give your fans and those who are maybe new, uh, to, you know, have a chance to, you know, listen to you. Oh, there's the merch that's just going down right there. Have a chance to listen to, Go to the house. Yeah, uh, we're just going to do some quick rapid fire questions if you're cool with that. Just whatever comes to mind first, you know, let us hear it. Bring it on. All right, cool. Favorite fruit in the fridge. What you got? Favorite fruit. Favorite food. Uh, Sorry, food, food, food. Food or fruit? Okay. Food, food, food. food. Man, I, this isn't in the fridge, but I've been crushing ramen. And in Nashville, like, I highly recommend Black Dynasty and Otaku because, shit, ramen is, like, my favorite thing in the entire world. And I've been okay. cooking ramen, too, so ramen okay okay uh best party you've been to <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, best party i've been to <laughs> wow um yeah. i went to a party at john rich's house which was kind of sick over on love circle oh, there you go oh okay okay man yeah. I, you got into that one okay yeah, buddy. <laughs> okay all right we're coming in kind of hot on this levi uh don't shoot the messenger right. why is it that you type in because we were doing some research on you last right. night. Levi Hummin, Levi Hummin girlfriend is the third recommendation uh, that Google gives you from the top of the list. <laughs> well, here's the deal is I, I have, okay, I've, I've been with this girl for eight months. We actually just moved in together and I'm like the friggin' happiest I've ever been. But mm -hmm. we have not been to any red carpets, done anything like that. So that, like on Getty images and all that, like you look her up and she like doesn't exist as my girlfriend yet. So I want everybody to know I do have a girlfriend, but I also love my fans, and I uh, I hope you guys love both of us. Okay, okay. <laughs> Wait, with that face, we wouldn't expect anything else, man. Hold up. All right, so favorite place to have a beer in Nashville? <clears throat> Woo! It used to be uh, Bastion's, and that's over in, like, Wedgwood, Houston. Uh -huh. It's a like, cool little trendy bar, um, but now I'd say Red Door. Red Door. Red Door, you are a big Red Door guy, aren't you? You big Midtown Red Door guy. I used to be a big red door guy until I turned 29 and now like hanging over really, really hard. <laughs> All right. What about, um, this is a good one right here. We know your family, you know, won't let anybody else uh, that's not an Ohio state fan come watch any of these playoffs games. I know I haven't been invited to watch one yet. That being said, are you more of a Tennessee Titans fan or Ohio state Buckeyes fan or Cleveland Cavaliers fan. I know Kenny mentioned, you know, you're not a big basketball guy, but you've got to have some Cavs jeans in your right? Hey, first of all, I, I am way more of a fan of all those in Kenny is. So don't I, that's what I was saying. I was like, you didn't even watch any sports this year. <laughs> Bro, I literally am like, I went to like five Titans games. Yeah. Uh, I am a huge Ohio state fan because it's in my blood. I mean, I just can't get rid of it no matter what. 
Um, I am a huge Titans fan because I just love the Titans and I love my city. And I'm a Cavs fan, but I'm more of a LeBron fan, to be honest, because he's from Ohio and Akron kid. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say equal Titans in Ohio State. But LeBron is my – I like the Lakers now. So I'm a horrible yeah. person probably, but that's just what well, I'll stick to. Okay. All I'm saying is you guys would let me come to a come over for a Lakers game, but not Ohio State. Uh, yes, I, I Ohio, State, yeah. Ohio State. Ohio <laughs> probably can't come over because my dad will probably – like because we watch it at my parents' house, my dad won't let you in. All right. How about this one? Tell us about the time that you became the high school's lacrosse goalie when no one else wanted to. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> can you recommend these questions? What is going on? Only this one. Only All this right, one. So, Kaney is my middle brother for everybody that doesn't know. Uh, and it's spelled C A N E Y. I just want to confirm that it's not KT. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, I don't even remember the lacrosse thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Our goalie. We had no backup goalie, and our goalie went down with two broken collarbones in the game. Oh. And so I stepped in, and I had played, like, goalie in eighth grade. Um, it was my junior year, and – or was it my senior year or junior year? He's not there anymore. I thought my dad was there. Uh, it was my senior year, and uh, ended up, like, playing goalie. I did pretty well, but I had, like, 50 saves, which is, like, insane against NBA, Brentwood Academy, all these schools – and my like, uh, like lacrosse stats on, uh, I think it was like score depot or whatever. Mm-hmm. We're like the best goalie for these four games in the entire state. Oh, and I remember that cause I was like, I was like, <laughs> I was like, I, I was like, I am a good goalie. And then I played in college for a little bit too. Okay. I was about to say, I was going to be like, you know, okay. Uh, college lacrosse or music, uh, which one? Yeah. I, I played college lacrosse. Uh, it was a uh, club, but we played like actual teams. So Eckerd couldn't recruit people, so they had to have a club team. But we played like FGCU. We played a pro team called Miami Dade. We played Birmingham, like all these freaking like huge schools. Uh-huh. Um, and then I ended up playing at Belmont before I dropped out for a little bit. Okay. I, uh, I I dabbled a little bit in lacrosse my senior year of high school. I think yeah, uh, you did, you did. Liam. I think Josh Gowan kind of got me there. He was like, "Hey, you know, <laughs> you can only do it one more year, and this is your last year here. Give it a roll, uh, you know, kind of just a whirl." And I. I did pretty well. I was a uh, I don't know what position. I, I scored the the ball a lot. I don't know what position. Riker? Attack. Attack. I was an okay. attack. Man. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. Liam, clearly stick to <laughs> basketball, dude. Listen. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, Levi, how about this one? Most famous person that slid into the DMs. What you got? <laughs> I don't want to talk about this. Oh no, man, you know, it could be a guy, dude. Come on now. Tell uh, me I'm trying to think. Uh, well, this is my friend, but Kelsey Ballerini is my homie. We like, oh. but yeah. And probably the most famous person that I've talked to. Yeah. It's like all the country. I know every country artist. We all, we, we all talk TR okay. and all them are pretty cool. And everybody. Okay, cool. Most nervous moment in your life, or maybe one of, you don't look like a nervous answering, dude, but answering that question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I got you. I, I, I got you answer a PC. Like I got you. What about uh, the. Most nervous moment in your life? What you got? Ah, oh, man. Most nerve. I don't really get nervous. I get like anxious, but like that excited anxious. So I get right. like pumped up every time. I think that comes from playing sports, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the most pumped up I ever got, like excited, was Lake Shake in Chicago. Um, we were playing just the next from National Stage, but I swear to God, there was like people, there's a huge tent at this festival. And there were people, like 3,000 people lined up outside of the tent, all surrounding the tent. It was the biggest crowd I've ever played for that was just me. Mm-hmm. And everybody was just like, Levi, Levi. And I was <laughs> like, screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I got so p- pumped up. I mean, that was like one of the best shows of my entire life. And you just killed it. We all know. Um, what about this one is kind of more of our serious one, but you can be playful with it, whatever, do whatever you want with it. If you had the world's attention for 30 seconds, I don't know if you'd want it anyways, but what yeah. would you say? Uh, if I had the world's attention for 30 seconds, I would say go stream my new single, A Home. There you and go. <laughs> seven there billion you go. streams later. And then I'd also say, I was like, everybody love everybody. Yeah. ELE. Yeah. ELE, baby. Come on. Levi, you got a dream car? Dream car. I actually love my car that I got right now. I got a Tahoe. Um, I got the one that's like before it became boxy. So uh-huh. it's like the presidential vibe. Um, if I had to get a car car, like a fast car or something like that, I get like a souped up challenger probably. 
Okay, he wants the souped up challenger. Okay. Like, forget, I want to be like uh, Vin Diesel. Just, <laughs> <laughs> and just like only, only like tank tops. Oh, with the aviators on. <laughs> All right, what do, we got a couple more for you, Levi. Thanks for hanging with us. Um, LeBron or MJ? I think we might know this one, but I don't know. LeBron. Okay, cool. Any reason think, why or just, just quick reasoning? Uh, quick reasoning is I'm a huge LeBron fan, so I'm super biased. Um, okay. I never saw really MJ play, uh, but it's crazy that LeBron is as old as he is and he's just getting better. I mean, still getting better. You, you think about that and like he still has longevity to his career. I think that he's always going to be – there's always going to be that conversation, but whew, LeBron is freaking up there. That's we're, we're rooting for LeBron's legacy too, but I'll tell you what, after that MJ doc, we kind of understood more about what was going on back then. Right. So, right. Um, all right, here's a funny one. We got Levi Hummond or Jake Paul. Who are you taking? <laughs> I don't even, I didn't like that guy at all. Like I would, I can't even, I, so I box like every day. Like that's like what I do yeah. uh, in the gym now. And that dude is just like such a joker. Like he just has, I just don't like, I don't even want to talk about him because Barstool talks about him. Everybody talks. He just needs to shut the fuck up and just move on. I'm so dumb. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, get him in the ring, dude. Shut him up. Humble the guy. He needs to be humbled, right? I just don't get like, if you're going to be talking shit and stuff and like, just, like slapping your money around, why don't you like fight a real boxer then? Right. Why don't right. you like, you're like fighting a, he's like, boxing is like the true sport, like whatever. And then you won't fight a real guy that can throw fists. Right. I think he's boxing some retired MMA guy who <laughs> just has hip, hip, hip surgery and stuff like that. Um, okay. We got two more for you leaves. Um, best relationship advice. <clears throat> Man, I never thought that I would have a relationship that I'm in right now. Um, but I think when you're in the right relationship, there's just like the drama is just so small. Like there's just like the things that like maybe in your own life that are dramatic, like exist and you can like talk about it. But I, for the first time in a relationship where there's no drama, there's no questions I have about us. It's just all answers and it's all like peace and just like straight up love. You tell me no arguments at all. None at all. Yeah, but, like our little biggers, but I'm saying that when I, like in the last relationship, I was always defending this person and I was always like, oh man, like I just want things to be right. And mm -hmm. there's never that question anymore. And I think that um, somebody always said that that was going to happen when you're in the right relationship. And I'm finally mm -hmm. in that and like, just thankful. All right. We're looking, Hey, we love to see that smile on your face, <laughs> Levi. You're looking happy nowadays. All I right. Last, <laughs> last one here. We ask everybody this best NBA show out there, NBA, the jump inside the NBA or the boys over at man to man. Man to man. Come on, baby. All day. All day, baby. Hey, we got Levi Homan, man. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for hanging out with the boys, man. We know you got a busy regimen. We appreciate it. Um, for those wanting to keep up with you daily, where can they find you on social media? Levi Homan, everything. Okay. Levi Homan. Here we go. I will say this. I'm going to do one, one last shout out. Check out my new single, A Home. I also got this brand new merch line called 3686, which is Nashville based. Um, I have big plans for this merch company. Uh, it's going to support local Nashville artists eventually and we're getting there and check it out love it man we'll throw you some merch maybe we do a merch exchange or something because i know you've been dropping the merch and it looks cool yeah, as hell man. let's do it um all right man we got levi Hummett, man we're uh we're sending nothing we're sending you nothing but good vibes you know good health and much success going forward take care brother and we'll talk to you soon all right you too man yo levi Hummett, man we appreciate him coming on our show uh and talking to the boys over at man to man he's got the new hot single out called a home uh, Levi, again, we're, uh, we're, we're close fr friends with his younger brother. And again, it's just a small world here in Nashville. So it's super fun to bring these, uh, musicians on who, you know, we kind of have an, uh, a chance to know and, and, uh, and, and even give you guys a chance to, uh, understand who these guys and, and figure out who the, the next star on the rise is like, we got to say, he's got a lot of potential going for him and, you know, it's just another guy that's just, on the cups and you know, he's, he's in love and he's doing it and he's looking happy. So if he's happy and he's feeling good, Liam, I'd suspect, you know, this album's going to be a little banger for 2021, right? Yeah. He kind of said, I can't talk about the the yeah. new project. I'm, I'm curious to see what that's all about. Um, but I was, it was funny. I was talking to my mother afterwards. I was like, we just, you know, uh, interviewed Levi Hummond and this and that. She's like, Oh, Marcus Hummond's son. And I was like, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's him. And she's like, oh, well, yeah. you know what? Back in the day, I sold him a house when he first moved to Nashville. I was like, <laughs> okay, cool, cool deal, mom. Uh, yeah. Small like, world, you know, small world. Yeah. Um, but let's get into this second part of our episode um, with our gambling segment. Mm-hmm. Big, big gambling uh, week for us last week. Both went 2-0 and in our picks. Uh, I think that's big for the brand. Uh, I kept mm-hmm. telling you huge, that. Huge, huge for the brand. Yeah, so we're, we'll hopefully uh, get on uh, the, the right track again this week. Uh, but let's start with our uh, records, uh, our picking records uh I caught up a little bit. I'm still six games back, but mm-hmm. you sometimes you don't go against me. You just pick all the same same teams as I do, and you're oh, like, "Hey, I guess uh, I'm not trying to lose another game tonight." I feel like sometimes. I'll tell you what. It was like a five slate game the other day, and I just all the favorites. Uh, what my my uh, reports, you know, my research was saying all the same things that you were you were touching. So I had to. I think uh, now we're both kind of doing our research. and, and it, it You started... got some research over there, dude? You ain't doing no damn research. Are you doing some research? Sometimes on the bigger, bigger <laughs> days, I'm like, all right, there's 12 games. I, I got to sneak one of them past them, right? Pick up right. one game here or there. Mm-hmm. But keep uh, tuning in for that this week. Uh, we'll see that. Uh, those, uh, those updated standings throughout the week. But uh, let's go into our game of the week. Uh, mm-hmm. And then our prop bet. Uh, I will start first. My uh, game of the week is going to be the Bucks versus the Suns Wednesday night on ESPN. We see Devin Booker averaging about 24 points a game right now. And mm-hmm. I think this is a huge game at home for the Suns to kind of start getting prepared, playing these you know good teams. And we saw that the Bucks have put a couple games here together, blowing some teams out. So I think this could be a real good test for the Suns. So I'm going to take Devin Booker over, you know, 24 and a half points, and I'll take the Suns spread. They'll probably uh, be the underdog in this, uh, probably minus probably four and a half, five and a half, could be upwards mm-hmm. to seven and a half points uh, underdog in this one. I'll take that. Uh, so Suns plus whatever the, the spread is, and – and we'll rock it and, and lock it in again this week, right? Man, that's that's almost sketchy taking the spread because it's it, – I don't know. I try to stay away from taking spreads against the Bucks because the Bucks is just like a team that can beat you by 20 right. or they're going to lose by 20. Right. I, I just feel like there's no game that's like super close with the Bucks. I don't know. I think the Suns are going to – I think the Suns are actually going to win this game. I'm not 100% sure because they are at home and – I don't know. They're on national televised, uh, you know, channel on ESPN, so they're gonna get up for this game, knowing people are watching it. So, the Suns, I think Devin Booker, he's he's only scoring twenty four. He can light it up for forty, and and, and Suns could take over this game easily. So, I think that would be you know a good game to watch this week for sure. What so. was the game uh, last week when he hit the game winning three? They were down, I think, ten in the fourth or something, and Devin Booker got a. Double screen from um, somebody else, and Chris Paul shoot him a little pass yeah, over to against the lead. the Mavericks. Yeah, yeah, it was a big time game. So, yeah, the Sun started out really, really hot, right? Like top top three, and yeah. then now they're I don't know where they're sitting at now, but I think they're they're more of the lower. The, I think the, yeah, yeah, I think the Warriors are like eighth spot right now, but the Suns are kind of past them. I don't know. The Suns just lost a lot of momentum. Um. Speaking of momentum, just real quick, those teams that had a bunch of momentum, you know, in the playoffs in the bubble last year, kind of, I mean, the Suns had it a little bit going into this season, but no other team really did. Like the Trailblazers are all right. I think the only, I mean, the Suns are kind of losing momentum. I think the only team that continued, really continued that momentum is the Utah Jazz, right? Right. I mean, They're coming into top that three, game, right? Seven, top yeah, three in the conference. In, yeah, and they're the only team to me that's almost been like, okay, now this is a continued team. Like these top three teams in the West are continued teams, but all these teams past that, I'm just like, okay, uh, anybody can beat anybody pretty much in the Western Conference. Right, kind of a coin flip. I, I agree with that. We see that the Clippers, Lakers, and Jazz are full tier. You know, I'll put them in the top tier, and then everybody below that are is kind of just, you know, throw your hands up and just throw them in there and see what happens basically. Uh, But yeah, I agree with that. That's, 
just right. just throw all these names in a hat and, and pick them out. But all right, I'm I'm rocking with it. I'm rocking with it. Bucks, Suns. Okay, okay. I don't know if I'm touching that one. Listen, I got <laughs> 76ers versus the Blazers. It's going to be a rematch here, right? So this game is on Thursday night, 10 p.m. Eastern time on TNT. This game is in Portland. This is uh, a rematch from last week. I think they played on the 4th of February and the 76ers surprisingly lost 125 to 105. Uh, this is a game that, you know, the Trailblazers had pretty much all their guys out. I know Dame was out with an abdominal strain and it wasn't COVID, but I think all these other guys were out with COVID. And then Gary Trent Jr. was this guy that had 24 points. Melo put up 22 and his Cantor 17, 18 rebounds. Uh, so I don't know. I, I know that same game and beat had like 37 or something and Ben Simmons sat out, but just kind of bizarre. Cause their odds last week were like minus 400 or something like the 76 or so don't really know what went wrong there, but it is the NBA and, and these are professionals and any team can beat any team. Kind of like what we talked about last week. Um, Dame is still out with this injury. Don't know if he'll be back for this game. Hopefully he will. We don't know how serious this injury is yet. Um, but I will take the 76ers money line on this one. I think, you know, this is a, a revenge game for these guys. And Embiid is averaging close to 11 rebounds a game. So I'm going to take Embiid over nine and a half rebounds. He's uh, ranked 11th on the leaderboard of rebounds. A lot of guys getting, you know, getting big boards this season, averaging big numbers, uh, crashing the boards, but Embiid is is just a guy who I can just see getting ten rebounds pretty easily in the game, which is kind of weird to say. Now it's like, okay, you're gonna get ten rebounds game. It's like, yeah, probably. I think you'll be able to get ten rebounds, and I, I'll take seventy six as money line as well. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think that's a that's another good one. You uh, while we were preparing a little bit for this this week, you uh, asked me, can I get uh, two games of the week? And I said, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's how game of the week works. Usually, you just pick one. Um, but yeah. I like that you picked that one. That will be, you know, kind of a, a late game, you know, during the week. You're getting ready for the weekend, and you just, you know, probably follow. I think the other game is I had Celtics Jazz okay. on Wednesday night or something like that. I thought it would just be a, a cool matchup, not a finals preview, but more of like a junior finals preview maybe. Yeah, some contenders definitely in there mm -hmm. uh, with that one. But let's run through our Pacer segment real quick. Uh Kind of a rough week for us. We played the 76ers early uh, in the kind week. Kind of just didn't show up. Um, and Tobias Harris pretty much torched us. And that's the thing. Uh, we played the Bucks as well this week. But with the 76ers and the Bucks, I feel like we just never can beat them, no matter what mm -hmm. is going, going on. We just play down when we play up against these two teams. I don't know. Right. Um, but then on uh, Tuesday we we you know got cooking again with the Grizzlies. We just torched them basically. We we're, we're shooting a lot more threes this year is what it comes down to me. You know we're we're just you know I think the new coach Nate Nate's Nate's out there <laughs> the saying new Nate. yeah the new Nate's out there saying you know if you're open let's let's let it ride this year because right, that's kind of what the 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 NBA's. Uh, kind of transitioning to mm -hmm. again we got national televised against the Bucks. And we got absolutely torched. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what else to say. Giannis just triple double looks like the MVP every single time. And then we closed out the week against the Pelicans, and we basically just ran out of time. Uh, we were down like 15 in the first quarter, and we just were playing catch. I think that our, our bench caught us up there in the fourth quarter, and yeah. Brogdon and Sabonis wasn't in the last play of the game, and people were like, why, why, why? And it's like, okay, I get the bench was getting you guys points, but still put them in the last play of the game. And and there was a play call for Miles Turner to try to, you know, take Lonzo off the dribble, and then that yeah, – just... and he missed it. Like, why was that the play of the game? It just doesn't make sense. So, uh, oh, Shout out to the bench, though, for, for at least, you know, making a name for themselves but yeah just tough week for the Pacers all in all yeah hopefully we'll get back on the right foot this week uh but I guess with that man this week's episode is going to come to a wrap if you guys enjoyed this episode again give us a good uh review five star ratings subscribe and most importantly 
Hey, share with your moms and get your damn merch, baby. There we go. That's what I'm waiting for every week. <laughs> uh, if you do want to keep up with us daily, go follow us on all of our social media. That's at Man to Man Podcast. And then definitely go check out Levi's new single, A Home, on all listening platforms. But as always, I'm going to namaste you guys out of here. So namaste to you guys. Namaste, Payson Nation, baby. <laughs> Straight hustling